Welcome to day four of JLTV's exclusive coverage of the 19th Maccabee Games, direct from the State of Israel. My name is Mitch Gaylord, coming to you from the JLTV Maccabee headquarters. Today we meet the basketball team from Guinea-Bissau. Yep, the African nation of Guinea-Bissau has a delegation at this year's Maccabee Games, and they are raising money during the games to combat malaria. You won't want to miss the Guinea-Bissauans introduce us to nothing but nets. Then, we meet some cricketeers from Australia, and for these cricketeers, the year's Maccabee Games is a family affair. But that's not all. Stick around, and you'll meet some more inspiring athletes playing in the 19th Maccabee Games. But first, JLTV's Brad Pomerantz takes us to Jerusalem, where the athletes from Guinea-Bissau are looking for nothing but nets. Welcome to Kafar Maccabea in Ramat Gan. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and I am here with the head of the delegation from Guinea-Bissau. Yes, there is a delegation from Guinea-Bissau. His name is Andrew Zabo, and I'm just thrilled to meet you. I had no idea there were Jewish people in Guinea-Bissau. There are Jewish people everywhere, and I'm very happy to meet you. Absolutely. Now, I want to speak with you at first about Guinea-Bissau. My guess is many of our viewers have no idea where it is. Uh, it's European influence, if any. Tell us about it. It's really funny because wherever I go, everybody thinks that I printed my passport myself. Right. Like, what is what, what is this? Right. Like people are Googling, what, what is this country? Yes, Guinea-Bissau is a country, and uh, now that you're watching this TV show, you're learning something new. Uh, you don't even need to Google it. Guinea-Bissau is a tiny country in West Africa. Uh -huh. It's the second smallest country in continental Africa. It's directly south of Senegal, right on the coast. Uh, it's been famous or infamous because of uh, cocaine smuggling and coups and revolutions right. in most recent years. Uh, but, but what's it, interesting is we know that in 1492 the Jews were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula and several Jews actually went to Guinea-Bissau in the 1600s. Exactly. So there had been some Jewish and they were Portuguese, as I understand, and Guinea-Bissau has that Portuguese influence. Yes, there were many Jews who settled that coast, the Guinean coast, up and down the coast, and they were trading uh, hides and wax and spices and gold. You know, the continent is rich in gold, and also later, it's a sad story, the Jews got involved with the slave trade, uh, which also originated uh, from that part of the world. Uh, so there was strong Jewish influence, right. Portuguese, Spanish Jews from, from the Iberian Peninsula. And currently the Jews who are doing business or who are residents of the country are either doing business with the government or involved with NGOs or involved with, uh, with mining right. projects. So I understand there really isn't much of an organized Jewish community in Guinea-Bissau, or maybe there is with the Maccabea team. You know, the first grassroots Jewish organization in Guinea-Bissau is the Guinea-Bissau Maccabee team. Uh, there's no organized community. People who can't afford to leave Guinea-Bissau, leave as soon as they can. So there's no permanent Jewish presence there. But uh, the people who are connected or tied to the country through their citizenship or resident status stick together. And, and that's how we formed the, uh, the Guinea-Bissau Maccabee team. So Andrew, I understand that you have 10 delegates, the largest delegation ever from Guinea-Bissau. What sports are they playing in? We're involved with basketball, lawn bowling, which is another question I get asked frequently, <laughs> and we have a single badminton player. Okay. So lawn bowling, basketball, and badminton. I want to speak about basketball, and in that context, I want to ask you about the horrific disease that we know as malaria. There's a connection. Tell us about malaria and how it impacts West Africa, Guinea-Bissau. Malaria is the number one killer of children in West Africa. It kills more people and more children than AIDS or any other disease in, uh, in West Africa. It's, uh, it's basically children die because of their weak immune system or their un underdeveloped immune system. They get bitten by uh, malaria-infected mosquitoes and they develop high fever and, and eventually die. Uh, the average life expectancy in Guinea-Bissau is 37 years old. It's not because people die s so young, but a lot of people under five die and that brings down the average. So uh, our goal with the team, our Tikkun Olam project, our Healing the World project, is uh, trying to save kids from getting malaria. It's very, very simple. If they spend the night under an insecticide-treated mosquito net, a malaria net. And there is the wordplay, if I may say. Your basketball team is supporting a charity called Nothing But 
nets. And it's like you said, very simple. You simply need to cover the children with a mosquito net. Children need to spend the night under a malaria mosquito net and then the mosquitoes don't attack. It's really the simplest way to save a kid's life. A net is uh, is alive for four or five years. Kids just sleep under the net when the mosquitoes attack because the malaria mosquitoes active are active from dusk to dawn. Right. And with $10, we can save a kid's life because that's how much it costs to buy one of these nets. And as I understand it, for every point scored, your team will be donating $10, is that right? Right, we have an anonymous donor who will donate $10 for, uh, for every score. And I have personally pledged to donate $1,000 for every medal that the team wins. And I think, uh, I think I'll be out like two, three grand. That would be great. Now, why are you doing this though? I mean, there's gotta be a reason. What touches you about this organization? It's more than an organization, it's a movement, and it's absolutely grassroots in our case because every dollar that is donated will go directly to the purchase and distribution. So we will go there ourselves and distribute the nets in the villages in Africa so there's no administrative overhead. It's not going to some big organization and we'll buy the nets locally. We feel strongly about this project because it's a very simple project, yet it touches so many lives and it can make a difference right. in the world. And I think that's our mission as Jews, to reach out to the larger community and to our entire planet and to the areas well, that we live in. I'd like to make a difference, and it's my pleasure to hand you 10 U.S. dollars wow. on behalf of myself and my family. And I hope that our viewers will be inspired to donate to Nothing But Nets because, like you said, it's about repairing the world so is there a website yes you go to maccabeeguinea.com and if you have a hard time spelling it <laughs> take, a, take a close up of my shirt it's right there maccabeeguinea.com we're taking donations online and if you're in the u.s it's a fully tax deductible through a u.s 501 c3 corporation and you can use your credit cards and really ten dollars can make a difference i think it's a fantastic charity Every 30 seconds, another child dies of malaria. In Africa, mosquitoes spread malaria at night. The malaria parasite is transmitted into the bloodstream when the mosquito bites. It produces high fevers, flu-like symptoms, and if untreated, coma and death. There may be up to 500 million cases of malaria this year. More than one million may die. But there's a simple way to prevent this suffering. An insecticide-treated bed net can protect a family for four to five years. It only costs $10 to purchase and distribute, and you can help. Since the beginning of this video, another three lives were lost. These children can't wait another night. Join the Nothing But Nets campaign and take action now. Okay, from Kafar Maccabee, I'm Brad Palmer, and it's going to Jerusalem tomorrow to watch Guinea-Bissau take on the Australians. So we're in Jerusalem, and I'm here with Yosef Horowitz, who is a player on the Guinea-Bissau basketball team. First of all, Jews, Guinea-Bissau. And we have a race from Budapest to uh, Guinea-Bissau every year in January, a car race, 9,000 kilometers. And, and coming there, seeing the situation there, it's horrible. I mean, you have a large percent of the kids are dying because of malaria, and we decided as a, uh, you know, tikkun olam to take that on to ourselves, bring, first of all, awareness to the cause and raise money, um, and we're going to send nets for the kids to cover the kids in malaria. It's really the only way to save the kids um, from this horrible disease. And uh, we, our goal was to raise $10,000. We surpassed it and raised $17,000 already, and we're still going. Um, the website is guinea bissaurallybound.com. So talk to me about coming to Israel, coming to the Maccabea Games, supporting not necessarily a Jewish cause, but a humanitarian cause. Sure. I mean, we're all God's children, and you know, Jews are all about tikkun olam, making sure we make this play, this world a better place. Um, when we came in, when we leave, it's a better place. Ultimate to the ultimate, you know, world of peace and harmony. And the way to do that is really be, it should be a global cause, not just about Jews, but anybody that needs help to take on that cause. 
Okay, let's talk basketball. About to play your first game against Australia. What do you think? Oh, I think our guys are talented. I'm kind of bottom of the bench. I'll be cheerleading a lot, but we have a great coach, uh, Matija Fergan, who's a pro player, and we have a bunch of guys that are going to play very hard, and we're going to compete. We respect the game, respect the opponents, and bring awareness to the cause. That's what we're trying to do. Moti, get on over here. We're going to talk to the coach now. His name is Moti. Hey, Fergan. And I want to talk to you about Guinea-Bissau. How did you get involved in supporting the Mac? be a movement in Guinea-Bissau. Well, like any other good Jew, it all started at Temple. Okay. And uh, meeting these guys at Temple, they, were, they came to me with the cause and with the idea. Took them some convincing, but uh, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to be part of this. And talk to me about the campaign of Tikkun Olam to help the children of Guinea-Bissau who are struck with malaria so very often. Well, th this is exactly what Yosef said. It, it's all about, you know, unity and around the world. It doesn't matter you know, who we are. I'm a true believer that we all God's children and we, we should help any way we can. And what about Guinea-Bissau? I mean, it's a nation uh, in West Africa, tiny, tiny, tiny. The Jewish community is also small. There had been a historic Jewish community uh, through Portugal, but now it, it, it's not really thriving, but yet 10, 10 Maccabeans here supporting Guinea-Bissau. Well, we are, we are trying to make it happen and trying to make it work for everyone. Okay, let's talk basketball. First game about to start against the Australians. You got some big guys. I saw you practicing. Got some talent there. What do you think? You know, we're, we're big. We're, we're, we have a lot of heart. We're going to play, play together. The Australian teams are a team that plays Maccabi Victoria every year together for the last five years, so they're a lot more organized. But we're going to give it our best shot, and we're going to leave our hearts on the court. Okay, let's go take a look. We're heading down to Lerner Sports Complex to watch Guinea-Bissau play Australia. It was a tough loss for Team Guinea-Bissau. They went down in their first game to the Australians, but it was all for a good cause to raise money to save the children of this West African nation from malaria. Reporting from Jerusalem, I'm Brad Pomerantz at the 19th Maccabee Games. When we come back, get ready to meet two generations of cricketeers from down under. Welcome back. The Australian cricket coach knows a thing or two about playing in the games. He did so for Maccabea Australia in, uh, well, let's just watch and find out. That's right, Mitch. He kind of knows a lot about cricket. And the reason why is he was actually one of the test crickets in Australia in the late 70s and early 80s. Let's meet Julian Wiener. Julian, welcome to JLTV. Thank you. How are you? Good. So is it right. exciting for you to come to the Maccabea Games and play with your two sons? Uh, I mean, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. My wife is here as well. So it's like a family road trip to Israel for the Maccabea. I heard that you uh, not only were a test cricket, you also have some cards. Some, oh yes, yes, some, some collector's cards, yeah, yeah, they're very embarrassing because it's from the late 70s when we had hair and moustaches and all sorts But of I hear that was probably very handsome at the time. Who told you that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, it's not for me to say, but if you say so, that's great, thank you. And um, you're also very accomplished, you won a gold in 83, the Maccabee Games. Yeah. yeah, that was fantastic, we had a very strong team, uh, we played well and ended up winning the, the tournament, which was fantastic. You came here to the Games and you wanted to perhaps take another medal with your two sons? That'd be great. Uh, everybody's prepared very well. Um, the competition's very tough. All the teams have prepared extremely well, so we've still got a game to win here, so hopefully we go well. So I know you've been to Israel before. What about your sons? Have they been here before? Uh, my oldest son, Dean, has been. He was here in, nine, in, two, in 2009, uh, and uh, Brett hasn't been here before, but now the whole family's here. It's fantastic. So how did it feel to be here with your sons and your family in the Teddy Stadium for opening ceremonies? How yeah. did that feel? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little uh, insight. I just had a little cry because it doesn't often happen with two children and your wife here. Do me a favor. If you happen to win a 
at all. Do you think I could try it on? 100%, 100%. Thank you so much. All right, good luck. It's fantastic. I've got to go. Okay, well, thank go. you. Good luck in your game. All the best. Nice to meet you. That was, uh, that was Julian Wiener giving us some of his time. He's a fantastic player, won gold in 83. And we'll check him out and watch a little bit, and maybe I'll get someone to show me how to hit the ball. So cricket looks like a really interesting sport, and I want to learn how to bat. So David here is going to show me how to do that. So go ahead, how do I do it? No worries. Well, um, if the ball is coming from your direction, okay. there's, there's obviously certain spots. If the ball's short, I can, I, can, I can play right or I can play left. It all depends on which way or how, how deep the ball's actually bowling. If it's full, I can actually drive it. I can play forwards. But if it's short enough and it's going to step up here, I'll be playing back. Playing Let's just do an easy swing. I want to see if I can actually hit it. Okay. You want to hit it? Yeah, show me how. So I can... Which way, which way you want me? I like this. Now, how, am I holding it right? You are holding it right. You still? Yeah, you are holding it right. So and you, he said earlier that I couldn't hit it. We'll see. I've never done this before. All right. You're doing very well. You're doing are, very are you, well. Really? Okay. Surprisingly well. All right. Surprisingly, Surprisingly whatever. Surprisingly. Am I doing it right? Yes. Just want to go forwards. Forward. So your feet starts like this. Okay. Just to go All right. This is for the gold. Okay. This is for Big Bunny. <gasps> Can I hit it harder? Yikes! He's in trouble now. I'm not that hard. So I did okay. You're very well. You're very well. Thank you. So I'm here with Rachel Beebe, who's the manager of the Australian cricket team. Uh, you're the only female on the team. Explain that. <laughs> that happened by default. Uh, the original manager, his wife fell pregnant, and so they were, they were looking around and they, they needed some help. But you volunteered. I did volunteer for this position, and I'm very grateful to be here. They, they definitely needed a mum in their team, and uh, that's what I've, I've been to them and provided for them. Now she's been wonderful. She's been offering lots of drinks, and it's very hot here today. Now, they're wearing all white and it's long sleeves. You would think that maybe in this kind of weather, they would let them go a little bit shorter. It's actually regulations. You must, it's a gentleman's game, actually, cricket. Uh, so you need to always present as a gentleman. And so you're always in whites. And usually it's always tucked in whites as well. So the long pants with the, with the uh, collars, always collars, and sleeves, and always tucked in. When they're playing in winter, they do actually also wear a white vest over the top as well. Uh, you, you need to present well. Also, the reason why it's white is because we use a, a red ball. So if they're wearing lots of colours, it's going to make it quite difficult to see the ball coming at you and, and makes the game quite a lot harder. It makes it quite, it's quite a tactical move to wear white. What is the ball made out of? It looks like it could hurt if you're not wearing gloves to catch it. Um, it's smaller than a baseball, but it'd be harder than a baseball. It's probably as hard as a golf ball. So if you get hit in the head from close range, it, uh, it, it would hurt. Typical cricket equipment includes thigh pads, a helmet, gloves, your whites, keeper pads, a ball, and plenty of sunscreen. And oh, don't forget the bat, which is made out of white willow wood, where the striking surface is flat and the backside has a ridge. Do I, do I need that to play? You don't, you don't necessarily need a helmet. Do I have to open this thing? The chin thing, no? No, you don't. Just put it on under your chin. That goes under your chin. Push. Yeah, I don't feel silly, but I guess this is the cricket way. And you meant to see through there. Do I look professional? You look very good. This is for JLTV only. Just make sure that we know that it looks really professional. You might want to stand back for this one because I'm pretty strong. That's two for two. Okay, one more. Yeah! <laughs> That's for JLTV. Do you play the game? I'll have to admit no. <laughs> but you know all the rules. Starting to get around them. I, I won't say I know all of them, but I'm, I'm starting to get a handle on most of them. Explain to me what's about to happen. Um, our ball's about to come in. Here's the ball from behind a white line. And um, that was a no ball. The umpire's going to put his arm up here. A no ball means he went too far over that white line meaning the other team get a run and the batsman gets a free hit. A free hit means he cannot go out on this ball. So he's doing another shot now? Yes, he does. Uh, he bowls six balls in the over, so he has to bowl another ball, and this is the ball, he can't go out. So he swung. Nice. 
I just ran a single, so yeah, so that's one run to the um, that's one run to Canada. Sorry, 11 plays on the field, including the keeper and the bowler. So that means you got nine fieldsmen. Do you, uh, women play cricket? Women do play cricket. A lot of women play cricket. There's a, a women's cricket league for sure. You can play for your country. There are some very good players in girls cricket. What's a run? Um, if you hit the ball and you just run in, like, like just cross sides, like cross sides. If if they go for a run and a, and a fieldsman throws it in, or if the, if the if the ball the ball has to hit the stump, and the batsman has to be short of the line for him to be run out. Oh, is his nickname Julie? Uh, we call him uh, Julius. Actually, we call him Julius. We all look up to him. Um, there's a basketballer called Julius Irving, and uh, he played many years ago, and he was he was a big time player. So glad to see a woman taking charge of being manager of the team. Of and uh, of course, we hope that uh, Australia does really well. And keep us posted, keep JLTV posted on how you do. For sure. Thanks so much for coming down and showing your support for us. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Team Australia proved to be the dominating force and beat Canada. It's that time again, the Maccabee Minute, brought to us by the Jewish Agency for Israel. I am a EDD of gerontology, which is the study of aging, and I always say middle age is 10 years older than I am. When I was 14, I was asked to come here in 1957 and uh, competed in the United States, which is the greatest, greatest thing. I've been doing so ever since. This is one of my uh, caps from a previous Maccabea. I'm 70 right now. I'm in a new age group, so it's kind of being the new kid on the block. There's a lot of fast little ladies out there too. And it's great to see people you've known for decades. The most important thing being in Israel is that you are home. Every time I've come to Israel, which is the bar mitzvah number, and this will be my 14th time, so the number 14 has a special meaning for this Maccabi, is you are coming home. You are not a minority. You are welcome wherever. And you don't have to explain yourself. So I did grow up in the Lower East Side in New York, the HUD. When you walk into the stadium, you are so welcome. There are just tens of thousands of people cheering for you and for every country. What's so amazing is there's over 70 countries in this one, and it's really, really special to just have that fantastic welcome. And it doesn't matter where, um, where you swim, what you do, what you're doing is you're just expressing yourself as being a Jew. This is who we are. Let's take a look back at one of the most inspiring stories from the 18th Maccabea Games. These are boys who live, uh, I would say, 90% are from Mumbai. Uh, overall population of uh, India, of Indian Jews, is about, I would say, 8 to 10,000. There are six synagogues in Bombay. And Bombay, as, as you may know, is something like about 16 to 18 million inhabitants. Uh, most of this community we've got here are from a place called Thane where you have uh, a synagogue with 1,800 congregants. The name of the synagogue is Shara Shumayim, Gate of Heaven Synagogue, which is situated in Tane, about 35 kilometers from Tane. It has got one of the largest communities, of Jewish communities in India, that is about 4,500 Jews, where all over India, 40%, that about 1,800 Jews, are staying in the city of Tane. The synagogue is concentrated, it, has, it is the center of all Jewish activity. The fact is that, uh, that in India, the sky is the limit, and the boys are feeling more and more confident of their future. It wasn't very easy to bring the contingent, but we were very, uh, we were very lucky to have the 
support from a benefactor called Steve Soboroff and his group out of Los Angeles who provided us with our seed money of $75,000 and then we found the balance. This is my fifth Maccabea. I led three teams or led leading three teams from India and uh, also I had two teams out of Singapore where I got a silver medal in squash in 1989 and here we hope to get a medal, silver, who knows, maybe even gold. very close to Rabbi Gabby. In fact, I arrived like two weeks prior to his arrival with Rifki. Uh, we were close as a family. Uh, I saw him like say maybe a thousand times. Whenever he needed something, he used to come and come to me as, as I'm an old Indian hand. When he had to go to the tsunami, he needed some money, arranged it. He went there, no problems. Uh, he got everybody to put on tefillin. He was a very unique rabbi. Several of the boys among the community were bar mitzvahed with him. They all loved him. And in fact, we had, when uh, Rabbi Shimon and his wife came uh, to Bombay to see the bodies and collect the bodies, and I had to pick them up at the airport, we had a lot of our Indian Jewish community who were also present. And then in the synagogue, where little Moshe, for the first time, because even Shimon told me that Moshe never said anything about his mother, Ima, right up till that moment, and yet in the synagogue, it broke all our hearts. But we are very, very sorry that we lost a very dedicated and a very, very sincere rabbi, Rabbi Gabriel and his wife Ripke and three, four other tourists. But it has, it has moved, it has moved, it has uh, been like a threat for the Jewish community all over India that this first Jewish installation in so many years has been attacked and has been terrorized. So thereby the Jewish community is very much alert and they are taking all the precaution and the government of India is helping them by giving them the added security that they are asking for. The opening ceremony was grand. We took part in the Maccabiya Games. Uh, 2005 was my last Maccabiya. This was my second Maccabiya. Coming as a team manager, this time as a deputy, uh, deputy head of the, of the Indian delegation. It was quite amazing and it, it brings Jews from all, all corners of the world. It was something fantastic to see about 7,000 athletes uh, in emerging and converging into the state of Israel. I must say that uh, we had a compliment at the last opening ceremony that uh, we were dressed not informally but reasonably formally that we had suits and we did the same thing this time and the, the team I think uh, created a very good image. They are very enthused. I'd say that this is probably the best cricket team that we've ever had. The game of cricket is a game of luck, but we have said the luck is on our side this time, so let's hope. We are determined to take the gold. We have, uh, we have chosen the highest uh, uh, medal, and let's hope we, we, we get to it. Cricket in Israel is here to stay, and uh, we are going to stimulate it even more. I'm Mitch Gaylord coming to you from the JLTV Maccabea headquarters. The 19th Maccabea Games on JLTV is brought to you in part by the Jewish Life Foundation. The Jewish Life Foundation uses the power of the media to educate, inform, and celebrate Jewish history, values, and traditions. If you would like to support the efforts of JLF, you can sign on to www.jewishlifefoundation.org where you can make a tax-free charitable contribution. On behalf of the Jewish Life Foundation, we sincerely thank you for your support. 
Thank you for joining us for day four of JLTV's exclusive coverage of the 19th Maccabee Games from the State of Israel. I'm Mitch Gaylord. You just got the chance to meet the silver winning Indian cricket team from the 18th Maccabee Games. Now I want to tell you about three brothers who are playing cricket in the 19th Maccabee Games. Two are from India, while one plays for Israel. Let's go meet them. Myself, Shaish Bangera, came to Israel in 2003. Came to Israel because I'm a Jewish guy. Came here to work in the military, play cricket in the Israel team. Right. Half of my mother's family lives in Israel, so we were since my childhood we were fascinated about Israel. To visit Israel, we live over there. The way these people live, they enjoy their life. So we were always fascinated about this life. So we made up our mind that one by one we'll come to Israel. Okay. So my brother, since he's elder to me, he got a chance uh, to go to Israel. Okay. He got a citizenship. He is working here right now. He's well settled. So I'm feeling very good about him. So if I got a chance, even I will come here. Everything but is outside. Hey, uh, Jitesh and Roshan. Huh? He's a smaller brother, no, Roshan Bangara. In India, the Jewish people are very few. It's around uh, 4,000 people are there in uh, India. And it's like uh, our culture is very small. Like our uh, religion is very small in India. So the cultures are like... Uh, we have, we have a very small crowd, so we celebrate our culture in our uh, own synagogues. So it's then, like, we, when we come over Israel, we, people, we see all the Israelis, and it's a good feeling to be in an see an Israeli people. Come on, come. Just a short words, wish you both teams good luck. I have a problem, yes? I'm no, from no, Israel. No going to represent Israel in India, who do I support? I think this is an amazing event. Uh, you have a small commun Jewish community in India, but a small Jewish community that's come with a fairly large team considering the size. And uh, they're very proud of cricket. As you know, cricket is almost a religion in India. So I think this is a very important game for India. I think it's also important for Israel-India ties. It's a sign of the uh, friendship between the countries. And I think it's a great opportunity for even for the Jewish community to learn about the small Jewish community that exists today in India today. It's still very vibrant and active. But this is a game that, um, the gentleman's game, uh, with very, very clear rules. And uh, I think it's a game that you can really use a lot to, um, as, a sign, as, a, as a sign of the friendship uh, between countries. It's really a very, very uh, cultural game. It's a game with a long history, and it uh, represents a lot for the people playing the game, I think. And I pray period for the under 16, under 19 for the school team, pray for college, and next time play for the club in India. When I came over here, my uncle, the Simtaka, took me to a team of Lions Lude. That's why playing over here in the Lions Lude, in the local team. They found the start of the journey from their first ever place, second ever came to Maccabi. Uh, Maccabi is very new to me, so uh, I've heard it for the first time. I never knew what is Maccabi. I came to know about Maccabi by my brother who lives in Israel for the last 10 years. He's an Israeli citizenship. He has an Israeli citizenship due to my mother. She is a Jewish. Okay, and cricket is my favorite from since childhood. I want to be a, wanted to be a cricketer. So international level uh, in Indian cricket is very tough. I don't have that of quality. But I got a chance in the Maccabi to get into it and represent India, which was my dream since childhood. So I got a chance and I took the chance. that you find family and friends all together, I think this makes the game even more exciting. And I think uh, even the, the brothers themselves are very excited to see who can prove who's the better cricket player. Yeah. My parents are very proud, proud of me now about my two brothers. 
playing for the international team, playing for India, playing for Israel. In India, playing cricket for the international team is very, very, very good, very high. I feel proud. They call me every day, who is going to be? My two brothers are against you. The mom says, no, they will, India will win. Mom is taking side of India. She's Indian. So mom says, don't worry. <laughs> I'm playing for Israel. Anything will happen. Are you uh, going to beat your brother? Yeah, I'll try my level best to beat him. <laughs> think so. <laughs> he thinks so, he's beat me. <laughs> this cricket. From the childhood, like we used to play cricket at our like the complex uh, in our building, and we used to play as a game. And this time we are playing with uh, uh, as a professional against each other. So it will be a great fun, and it will be a great challenge for me to compete him. And being a uh, being my elder uh, brother, so I think uh, it will be a difficult for me to play against him and like to compete and to fight. For, for the cup, for the gold. Since my childhood, it's, it's not new that I'm playing against my brother. We always have a different team. He's senior to me, three years seniors. Okay, he had a different team. I had a different. So we have always played against against us. Okay, so it's not new that I'm playing against him. Last match I played against him in Luth. It was a practice match for us. He was batting opposite me. So it is not new. We always play good when we are opposite. When we are together, we don't play good. He wants to win every time. He wants to win every time, every time. That will have no difference if you're a brother or anyone else. He wants to win. So today I think so he will go for the same thing. The last one also, the third one also. And me that do the same do it. If I'm playing for Israel, I want to Israel to win. That's it. So you're gonna beat them. Yeah. I want to enjoy a good game of cricket, okay? Of course, I'm an Israeli, but uh, the, we have our guests here, we'll treat them as guests, and I just want to see a good game. I really don't mind who wins. The uh, sense of the Jewish identity is extremely important, and I think through sport, it's, you have basic emotions of friendship, of comradeship. You see the connection of Jews around the world. I think that's probably the, the biggest, uh, strongest message of the Maccabi games. At the end of a very grueling match, it was India who came out on top and won. From Ashdod, Israel, I'm Egal Hecht at the 19th Maccabiah Games for JLTV. We're back with JLTV's exclusive coverage of the 19th Maccabiah Games. I'm Mitch Gaylord. Welcome to Maccabee Village in Ramat Gan, Israel. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Now you saw our Shea Yuval speaking with Lenny Kraselberg during opening ceremonies of these 19th Maccabee Games. Well, you know me. I like to pick up the handsome men and talk to them. So tell me, what's your role here at the Maccabee Games? I got a smile out of him. <laughs> well, I'm a former Olympic gold medalist, and this is a great honor for me to be one of the Maccabees who got a chance to carry the Maccabee flag. It's a pretty awesome experience. So, uh, what sport do you do? You, you uh, seem like you're very fit. I used to swim. Oh, and yeah? And, and your name, sir, is? Lenny Kraselberg. And did you win any gold medals? Uh, just a few. Four. <laughs> Four? Are you wearing any of them? Did you bring them? No, I didn't bring them today. I want to try them on. That's not fair. Next time. I, I would, if I would have known you wanted to try them on, I would have brought them. I'm just honored to be here uh, with all these Jewish athletes and this incredible celebration of Judaism and everyone coming together in Israel. I mean, you look at this stadium, it's pretty awesome. It's an incredible okay. atmosphere. Unbelievable. I mean, I just feel like dancing. What about you? Absolutely. Dancing right, we, is going to come. Absolutely. <laughs> 
O'Shea. Well, this multi-medal winning Olympian is not just committed to the Maccabea movement. Lenny Kraselberg is supremely committed to the Jewish children of his native land in Odessa, the third largest city in the Ukraine. So let's take a look at an interview that I recently did with Lenny to learn about his commitment to Tikva homes in Odessa. Well, for me, it's so important to support Tikva Odessa. Uh, first and foremost is the fact that I grew up in Odessa. And just to know the, the work that Tikva does uh, with a lot of youngsters out there teaching the Jewish values, giving him an opportunity, giving him an opportunity, an opportunity at life, an opportunity of loving, being loved, uh, a warm home. Uh, education, which is so important for our next generation, not just in this country, United States, but all over the world. And it's just such an incredible cause, and I'm honored and uh, excited to be part of it and supporting it. For me to support and find an uh, organization, a Jewish organization that is based or does a lot of their work in Odessa, in the city that I grew up, uh, it's, it's special. Um, I was fortunate uh, to grow up in a loving home with, a, with mom and dad and a sister uh, in a middle class family. And yet to know that there are so many Jewish kids in Odessa, in the surrounding areas that are homeless or don't let, have a loving home or abandoned by their parents, it, it's painful to see and to know that there is uh, this Jewish organization that uh, provides the support, gives them the love, uh, gives them the roof over their head and putting, puts them on the right path, it's, uh, it's incredible. I went to one mission in Odessa in uh, 2003 and it was incredibly powerful for me just to see the work uh, that uh, Tikva does but also to see these kids, to see the joy on their faces, uh, to, to, under to see them really understand or really be thankful for what so many people have given them that, that love, the opportunity, you know, opportunity of the roof above their head, about the education. Uh, it was very powerful. And some of the stories that they told us about kids really being abandoned and living on the streets, living in the subway stations, and now uh, living at the Tikwa houses. And uh, it, it, it was very humbling experience. <laughs> So Rebecca, tell us about Lenny and his connection to Odessa and his, the importance of his involvement in Tikva Home. So Lenny is really a star to us and it's a real honor for him to be part of our board and really connected to our cause. He is someone who grew up in the Odessa community and was fortunate enough to leave the Odessa community and become an Olympian swimmer mm -hmm. all in the same time. So to him, to hit to our children, Lenny is really a hero and um, is an instrumental face to our organization and we're just so honored that he always lends his name to our cause. Okay, thank you for joining us for day four of JLTV's exclusive coverage of the 19th Maccabee Games from the State of Israel. I'm Mitch Gaylord.
I'm Mitch Gaylord coming to you from the JLTV Maccabea headquarters. The 19th Maccabea Games on JLTV is brought to you in part by the Jewish Life Foundation. The Jewish Life Foundation uses the power of the media to educate, inform, and celebrate Jewish history, values, and traditions. If you would like to support the efforts of JLF, you can sign on to www.jewishlifefoundation.org where you can make a tax-free charitable contribution. On behalf of the Jewish Life Foundation, we sincerely thank you for your support.